How many of you at some point have thought about how food affects your health? I usually consider it when searching for chicken noodle soup when I'm sick and cursing myself for not getting enough vitamins to prevent ending up in that situation in the first place. A radical thought, but have you ever considered that a temporary lack of diet may also increase your health? Fasting is a routine that countless people swear by, and it's known to have numerous health-related benefits, including slowing down aging, reducing type 2 diabetes, and boosting the immune system. Now, as great as these outcomes are, we're not entirely sure how these processes occur, but we can start to unravel that mystery by getting clues from ourselves. Hi folks, my name is Cole, and I have a Master's of Immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at how fasting alters the immune system. So hang around with me throughout this whole video to get all of the relevant background information so we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, there is more information for you in the description below. Fasting is just the willful refrainment from eating. It's also the reason why the first meal of the day is called breakfast, to literally break the fast that you had because you were sleeping. Which, I guess, means that every meal could technically be called breakfast. Anyway. There are many different ways that you can fast, which include prolonged fasting, intermittent fasting, and fasting mimicking diets. What we're going to focus on today is this first one, which is not as well studied. Prolonged fasting is a complete water-only diet without regular food, which can only be maintained for a short period of time. So why exactly do people want to fast? As you've heard before, there are numerous health-related benefits, which can help reduce inflammation, increase focus, and heal digestion problems. Now, as the amount of time that you don't eat increases, the body goes more and more into a catabolic state of survival. This causes your body to burn fat, produce human growth hormone, and start ramping up a process called autophagy. These are caused by your body attempting to optimally regulate itself to a state of homeostasis. Now, there are a couple of routes that your body can take when seeking homeostasis that mutually inhibit one another. It can control the system, by killing cells with apoptosis, or it can conserve and optimize the cells with autophagy. Apoptosis is caused by cells undergoing programmed cell death, sending their cell contents neatly into space. This helps to clear infected and damaged cells and allows other cells to uptake the floating cellular nutrients. Autophagy is a process whereby cells clean up damaged or unnecessary organelles and protein aggregates inside of themselves, recycling their materials to be used for other cell structures and functions. This facilitates bioenergetic homeostasis. How the cells undergo autophagy is particularly neat. This function occurs by the cell rounding up the broken bits into a cellular container and fusing them with another container full of highly acidic and destructive proteins, effectively breaking everything down into its basic components. Now, studying this process in the human body remains a challenge, since assays we use to study it require treatment with pharmacological inhibitors, which are toxic. Luckily, we can assess differences in RNA transcripts, proteins, and cytokines from cells by simply collecting and analyzing blood samples, thus allowing us to observe changes as a result of specific treatments. This multi-omics approach is a powerful tool that tells us lots of information. However, it can take some work to fully identify what all of the changes are. By using a technique called principal component analysis, we can visualize strong patterns from large and complex datasets. This is done by clustering similar expression patterns together on a single axis, allowing us to fully make sense of all of the information that we're gathering. Now you can think of autophagy like the cell grooming itself and then eating whatever wasn't supposed to be there, which gives it energy for more important tasks like keeping us healthy. In charge of keeping us healthy is our immune system, which is made up of numerous leukocytes with specialized functions that all share a common marker, CD45. The immune system can then be further grouped based on its general responses to infection. The innate immune system is our first line of defense and targets anything foreign for destruction. Cells of the innate immune system include macrophages, natural killer cells, and neutrophils. However, the innate system is often not enough to clear infections by itself. It needs backup. This backup is called the adaptive immune system. It is responsible for specialized responses to pathogens that effectively clear and remember them, guarding against future reinfections. Now, these type of cells are also called lymphocytes and are made up of T and B cells. Intermittent fasting is known to have effects on all of the aforementioned cells. However, intensive fasting is not as well studied. And today, we're going to focus in on my favorite type of cell, neutrophils. These cells are generally 
first responders and are largely responsible for pathogen clearance through phagocytosis, degranulation, and the release of neutrophil extracellular traps. However, they can also modulate the immune response by interacting with other immune cells such as antigen-presenting cells or lymphocytes. Neutrophils can be activated by bacteria, foreign objects, and by specific chemicals, like the synthetic compound PMA, or by cytokines that other cells produce. Now, cytokines are particularly important because they play a key role in the regulation of the immune response. These signaling molecules initiate or constrain inflammatory responses, affecting many cells when facing infection and injury. Now, I want to take a moment and really highlight why investigating the effects of fasting is so important. Fasting is a free, accessible treatment that is available to everyone. And studying what happens during fasting gives insight on the way that our immunity is altered by simply changing our diet. Thus, immune changes can be coupled with pharmaceutical therapies to more effectively treat infections and disease. Now, if you also think that these are some important reasons to research this topic, go ahead and tap the like button. This brings us to the paper that we're focusing on today. This paper is called Innate Immune Remodeling by Short-Term Intensive Fasting by Qian Feng and Yuan et al. from Suzhou University in Suzhou, China. In this clinical study, the authors applied multi-omics tools to examine the impact of short-term intensive fasting on immune function. To start their analysis, the authors recruited 57 volunteers who had their blood drawn before and after 72 hours of short-term intensive fasting so that their immune cells could be isolated for both transcriptomic and proteomic analyses. For this to happen, the samples collected needed to be of high quality. This was challenging because most of the participants could not give enough sample on both time points. Thus, the authors were only able to collect four paired before and after samples, which formed their analytical group. Now, this is not a very large sample size, so they added three other samples before and after to also perform unpaired analysis for greater statistical power. Now, between the two groups, between paired and unpaired analyses, there was an abundance of RNA transcripts and proteins that were expressed. When trying to make sense of all of these molecules with a principal component analysis, distinct molecular signatures were exhibited depending on people's fasting state. Now, to determine the biological pathways that are activated or silenced during the intensive fasting process, the authors used overrepresentation analysis on both of their omics sets. They found an enrichment in many RNA and proteins that had to do with gene ontology biological processes, cellular components, and molecular function. By using a broad search approach, it was also found that fasting influences immunological functions, immune responses, metabolic processes, and response to stimuli. By using a deeper data analysis search, the authors identified specific enrichment in processes involved in innate immune activation and immune cell motility. When focusing in on the proteomic profiling, the authors found an increase in mammalian autophagy-related proteins and a decrease in autophagy-inhibiting proteins. Since autophagy is a protective homeostatic mechanism which often inhibits apoptosis, the authors also looked at the apoptotic status of all of the cell transcripts, and they found that there was a downregulation of RNA associated with apoptosis. Because profiling cells does not require as high-quality samples, those 57 total donors from before were still able to be utilized. The authors found that there was a significant increase in live cells, indicating reduced apoptosis. When exploring which immune cells were specifically changed from intensive fasting, the authors identified an elevation in neutrophil populations and a decrease in lymphocyte populations, but all were within the expected normal range. From the analyzed immune cell populations, which include neutrophils, macrophages, and lymphocytes, the authors wanted to specifically identify the changes in molecular signatures specific to each cell lineage. The changes that were primarily seen were in neutrophils. They found that there was a significant enrichment in both transcriptomic and proteomic markers for neutrophil degranulation, whereas there was no change in phagocytosis or neutrophil extracellular traps. Furthermore, when looking at all of the cytokines present, the authors identified a notable increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines following fasting, which primarily came from neutrophils and natural killer cells. Finally, using a gene set enrichment analysis, the authors compared fasted neutrophils to an online immunological signature database. They found that there were notable overlaps between fasted and activated neutrophils. There was an overlap with a dataset of neutrophils being stimulated by PMA, a common chemical cell agonist, 
and there was a particularly strong correlation with one data set of neutrophils stimulated with Francisella tularensis, the bacterial causative agent of tularemia, which humans can get, but rabbits, hares, and rodents are particularly susceptible to. Now, to quickly summarize everything all together, the author's data suggests that short-term intensive fasting remodels the molecular signature of leukocytes, particularly by increasing cell autophagy, decreasing cellular apoptosis, and enhancing neutrophil activity. Not only do I think these cellular findings are exciting to investigate and learn about, they're also significant in a broader context. This information is significant because it gives us some of the first insights as to how the immune system looks after short-term intensive fasting. Furthermore, the increase in neutrophil populations possibly indicates more effective pathogen clearance. This information can help guide combination treatments to infection or disease by working to enhance normal functions within the body. All science is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge, and these steps are driven by questions. And I had a few questions myself after reviewing this information. Now, cell expression profiles and genes are not the only things that can be modified in the cell. Proteins that are already created can be further modified in the cell in a process called post-translational modification. Therefore, what I'm curious about is how does fasting affect post-translational modifications and even epigenetic markers? There is also general evidence that intermittent fasting helps in daily life. But how effective is intensive fasting in regards to different diseases? Is it possibly more effective versus things like heart disease compared to getting infected with a cold? Additionally, because the average age of people tested during the omics profiling in this study were in their early 40s, and there's differences in your body depending on how old you are, is there a difference that age plays on the way that your body responds to fasting? As always, though, my final question revolves around you. What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about them in the comments section below. Also, let me know if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something, but more importantly, I hope you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. Well, that's everything for today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.